everyone. Thank you for joining us virtually for today's media availability. As we get started, can everyone please make sure their cameras are off and their microphones are muted? Due to the increasing risk of COVID-19, this availability and live stream is completely virtual. We're joined today by Mayor Don Iveson and City Manager Andre Korbold for an update from the Emergency Advisory Committee meeting. After the update, we will take questions from the media joining us today. I'll now turn the floor over to Mayor Iveson to begin today's update. Well, thanks, Chris, and good afternoon, and thank you all for joining us today. Today, City Council received an update of the City of Edmonton's ongoing response to COVID-19. The situation remains dire. COVID cases and numbers and hospitalizations are rising in the Edmonton zone. And I'm especially concerned with how variants appear to be driving a demographic shift in who's getting sick with COVID and winding up in the hospital a younger population that is still weeks or months away from widespread vaccination. So that said though, I'm very thankful that the provincial government has announced that it'll be expanding vaccine eligibility to all Albertans age 12 and older. And I'm told that since the AHS uh, sign-up portal opened this morning, more than 100,000 millennials have already booked vaccination appointments. So thank you millennials, I can't wait to see your vaccines. Now, I want to thank every eligible Edmontonian who's gotten vaccinated. One third of the Edmonton Zone's population have received their first shot, and more than 100,000 people are now fully vaccinated. This is a great progress, and we're still ahead of Calgary, too. Now, I'm also so grateful to have gotten the AstraZeneca vaccine last week myself, and I'm also thankful that more Edmontonians are now eligible to be immunized, as I said. So I do want to stress, though, that the advice from medical experts, including Dr. Hinshaw, the advice they've given us is that the vaccines approved in Canada are safe and the best vaccine is the one that is available to you the soonest. Now, as a result of the concerning growth in case numbers and hospitalization rates, the City of Edmonton is announcing service changes to accommodate the new provincial restrictions and to ensure we're doing our part to keep Edmontonians safe from the virus. Andre will get into the specifics of what these new restrictions mean for City of Edmonton services. But in the meantime, I wanna thank Edmontonians for their continued patience as we deal with the adjustments to our programming and services. We are firmly now in the third wave and it's exhausting. I understand that Edmontonians have been under an extreme amount of stress and that these new restrictions are causing upheaval in our personal lives and in our economy. But it's essential that we maintain our resilience and follow the public health restrictions so that we can get this third wave under control. Restarting our city, restarting our economy depends on getting this third wave under control. And we understand that most Edmontonians continue to do their best to comply, but for those who do not, city peace officers are prepared to work with EPS and public health inspectors to enforce the rules and protect the safety of our community. These new restrictions are hitting our economy and our business community hard, and we've heard their concerns. Employers and entrepreneurs are under a tremendous amount of stress right now, and it is frustrating and costly to have to deal with these cycles of opening and closing and opening and closing. And some businesses have even told us they feel they won't be able to survive this third wave. And I'm deeply worried about that, especially for the independent retailers who had so much vibrancy and economic impact into our economy. And so it's why the city has done what we can to support the negative impacts felt from COVID-19, including through our economic recovery grant, um, specifically close contact businesses, i.e. restaurants, retail, hair aesthetic services that have made a significant majority of the Edmonton Economic Recovery Grant stream recipient pool. And businesses can still apply for this grant and get support from your city. The city has also agreed to subsidize 100% of the 2021 BIA levy for all 13 Edmonton business improvement areas because we want to see Main Street survive and come back strong after the third wave because their success will help spur our overall recovery out of COVID-19. Now, a true recovery out of this pandemic means all Edmontonians are safe and a recovery for all of us means that we'll need to change some of the things we've done in the past and make them better which is why I was glad we got an update on how the city is adapting its support for our homeless community. 
Topino Isle may have closed, but our support for vulnerable Edmontonians continues through smaller, more dispersed shelter locations and many more transitional housing sites. This approach enables agencies to provide customized interactions at each site and obviously allow for better coverage throughout the city. City is also working with agency operators in these new locations and is co-developing good neighbor commitments for each site, which will include bringing additional amenities and services to keep uh, to these areas to keep them clean and safe as best we can. Now, these good neighbor commitments will be posted on agency websites linked from the City of Edmonton website and sent directly to residents and stakeholders directly around each location. Now, there's still a need for a permanent solution to homelessness. 300 people a night were staying at Tepinawao, and each of them with 300 very distinct complex needs. And so while we needed to set up a temporary shelter, I maintain that it is always better to have those people's needs met in a supportive housing context where wraparound 24 seven services can much more cost effectively be offered to them than in back alleys or at the Royal Alec or at the Remand Center. So there is a much more cost, of selection, cost effective and dignified solution to supporting vulnerable people, better than camps or shelters, and that's supportive housing. And so we will continue to advocate hard to the provincial government for the supports we need to end homelessness in this community. Because while the city is stepping up way outside of our jurisdiction to provide housing and supplement shelters um, and working with Homeward Trust to support those experiencing homelessness, the responsibility for these issues falls squarely on the senior orders of government. The federal government has stepped up with a commitment to end chronic homelessness and uh, over a $2.5 billion down payment on that with the Rapid Housing Initiative. Now we're still waiting to hear back from the provincial government on this issue and we won't let them off the hook because Edmontonians want a solution to homelessness, not another Band-Aid. So as the weather warms, I'm asking the provincial government to do right by Edmontonians and help us solve the issue of homelessness once and for all by committing to providing supports in the housing we're ready to deliver so that we're not in this troubling cycle of encampments and shelters for another year to come. Now finally, yesterday at my State of the City address, I talked about Edmontonians' remarkable ability to push through community tragedies, through innovative problem solving and a strong sense of community. Now COVID is another one of those community tragedies. And just like any other community tragedy, tragedy we've endured, I know our indomitable spirit will pull us through. And so I'm so proud of the work Edmontonians have done so far to mitigate the damaging effects of this pandemic. We're asking you to hold on a little while longer. Thank you for your patience and thank you for persevering, even though it's been so different or so difficult, pardon me. And with that, I'll pass it off to Andre. Thank you, Mayor Iveson. At today's Emergency Advisory Committee, administration provided information in four areas. How COVID is currently spreading in our community, what current actions the city is taking, how new restrictions affect our programs, and what metrics we will use to assess community recovery. There are a number of different things happening in our community, all of which are changing the balance of how this pandemic is affecting the city and Edmontonians. Moving us forward, more people are getting vaccinated every day. In the Edmonton Health Zone, 595,000 people, more than a third of Edmontonians, have received at least one vaccination dose, and over 100,000 people are fully vaccinated. This is steady progress. Edmontonians know the public health behaviors that keep everyone safe. Washing hands, physical distancing, avoiding gatherings, and wearing a mask. The city's bylaw officers continue to enforce the temporary face covering bylaw and compliance continues to remain very high. If you are among those who are doing the very best to keep everyone safe, we truly thank you. There's also significant caution. The number of cases is high and growing and the number of hospitalizations is growing. And of course, we're concerned about that. Recently, the provincial government announced restrictions in an effort to tip that balance the City of Edmonton is complying with those restrictions and some city programs will be continuing and some will be adjusted accordingly. The City is trying to get the right balance too. We have cancelled our all indoor recreation activities to meet the public health requirements. We have cancelled outdoor fitness classes and activities and we've cancelled bookings for sports fields, baseball diamonds and running tracks for at least three weeks. 
while we have closed those programs where people would gather, we are continuing some outdoor programs and keeping some facilities open. Sports fields, parks, trails, off-leash parks, and playgrounds remain open. Outdoor skate parks, basketball courts, and tennis courts also remain open. We encourage Edmontonians to use these facilities only with their household members and to keep their distance from others while they're doing. At the zoo, staff are gearing up for the spring as the weather gets warmer in the coming weeks. Animals will begin to be moved outside where more people will be able to see them. And the zoo just changed its spring and summer hours and is now open from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. We have opened the Victoria driving range and all three city operated golf courses at Rundle, Riverside, and Victoria. We're also finding new types of programming. Virtual fitness classes and zoo programs have been running for some time and will continue virtually. Edmontonians can find the latest recreational programming information on the website at movelearnplay.edmonton.ca. We thank Edmontonians for their patience as we adjust to these new requirements. We recognize that the back and forth of programming is stressful for both our customers and for City of Edmonton employees. These restrictions have required us to make additional difficult staff decisions. The April 30 restrictions of indoor recreation resulted in nearly 70 colleagues being temporarily, temporarily laid off, while about 40 avoided layoff by being temporarily assigned to other work and preparing for seasonal programs and services. And I thank those employees for their agility and their understanding. As the season changes from winter to spring, how the city is supporting Edmontonians without housing is also changing. The large shelters have closed and shelter services have been moved to several small community centers across the city. The new Spectrum facility at the Edmonton Exhibition Lands is opening and providing essential bridge housing. Right now, the city is balancing the reality of restrictions and concern with the responsibility to help keep people well. We're also preparing for next steps. We're monitoring the signs of recovery and planning for additional activities when they are safe and reasonable. We are monitoring the health of Edmontonians, the health of our economy, and the compliance with bylaws, all in an effort to ensure that we can make balanced and timely decisions when circumstances allow. We monitor the health of Edmontonians. The familiar measures are COVID case and hospitalization numbers. They are the basic indicators of the status of the pandemic, but health is not just me measured by sickness. We are also tracking the use of pop-up facilities and shelters the percentage of people vaccinated, and the use of our recreation facilities when they can be used. We monitor the health of the economy. We are tracking community activity and mobility, things like the numbers of people who are traveling in the region and beyond, going to school, going to libraries, visiting museums and galleries, riding transit and driving on the roads. And I recognize that some of those things can't happen now, but we continue to track them and be ready for when they can. We're also looking at the number and progress of construction projects and business startups because jobs are critical for ongoing economic success. We're monitoring bylaw compliance. We're relying on everyone to do their part and to keep their neighborhoods safe. And online dashboards with this information are now available publicly. In closing, the city continues to follow the guidance of provincial public health authorities to open programs in those limited cases where it is responsible to do so and to plan for future actions should that be appropriate. We are committed to transparency because our decisions impact the lives of Edmontonians. So we're publicly providing information about what we are monitoring and you can see it online. We think this steady approach is striking the right balance. Thank you for your time. And with that, we would be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Mayor and City Manager. Uh, we will now take questions from the four media outlets joining us today. As I call out your name, please unmute yourself and ask your question. Each reporter can ask one question and a follow-up. And please indicate if your question is for the mayor or the city manager. We'll start with Dustin Cook from the from the Edmonton Journal and Post Media. Go ahead, Dustin. Thank you very much, Chris. Hi, my question is for Andre. Andre, what is the city's enforcement plan for golf courses, basketball courts, and those recreation amenities uh, as they're staying open? Will this be operating on the trust model or will the city be requiring proof or 
uh, ID from residents to prove that they're in the same family? Thank you for the question, Dustin. It's really going to be a trust and verify model. Uh, we have a very uh, proactive uh, health safety compliance team made up, made up of public enforcement agencies, and they continue to tri triage the public complaints and respond to them. So we are monitoring the city, this team of health officials, police, peace officers, and fire rescue services, and occupational health and safety folks will be going to the places uh, based on that triage and based on the information. Uh, and I think we have good reason to trust Edmontonians given how high our compliance rate is, but we will trust and we will verify uh, based on what we're seeing. Dustin, do you have a follow-up question? I do, thank you. On a bit of a different topic, also probably for Andre. Andre, I'm hoping you can clarify uh, your presentation about the Expo Centre vaccination site. So is it, will it be closed temporarily or will it only be closed if the vaccine supply depletes? Because my understanding is bookings are being made there currently as the eligibility has just expanded. So can you just clarify that? Yeah, we thank you, Dustin. We are making uh, bookings where we can. We ex we anticipate that we will be closing the facility for a few days, uh, maybe a couple of weeks. It's all based on supply. And I can guarantee that if the supply is here, we will use it at the Expo Centre. But if there's no supply, uh, then, then we wouldn't operate the facility. We anticipate uh, only a short uh, pause in the use of the Expo Centre, and I don't have the specific dates yet. And I would just encourage people to go by the bookings that they can get for the Expo Centre. I anticipate within a couple of weeks and as supply increases, we will be ramping up the use of that facility. We have not yet reached capacity of it, which is uh, 7,000 immunizations per day, uh, but we have used every vaccine that has been uh, delivered and supplied to that Expo site, and every one of them have gone into arms. So we, we appreciate the work being done there. Thanks for your questions, Dustin. Next up, we'll go to Jeremy Thompson with CTV. Uh, hi there, this uh, question is for uh, the mayor. Um, obviously, with Tapinawau closed now, the uh, the cleaning process has, has begun there. Um, earlier today, CTV was denied a uh, a look inside, uh, just at sort of the the condition of the of the building and that sort of thing, and uh, also denied an interview with uh, a city representative about uh, about you know the cost of uh, of cleaning and and repairs at the uh, at the center there. Uh, so I'm just wondering why that might be uh you know is it not a, a taxpayer funded uh and owned building they shouldn't uh, the public sort of be able to to have that info well once the bills are all in of course we'll uh report for uh and account for uh the costs uh we had always understood that there were going to be costs there were some renovations that uh, were due anyway and the facility being closed um, provided an opportunity, an opportunity to do some of that cosmetic work on the facility. Uh, so we knew uh, eyes wide open going in that this was uh, that this use was going to have some wear and tear on the facility, but that it was. Um, remember, it is a fairly hard wearing building. You know, we run raves, and and even the chamber ball uh, can get a bit fuzzy at times. And so it's it's a very hard wearing facility, um, and. Uh, uh, there is some glass to replace. Uh, there are some uh, fixtures to replace, uh, um, but uh, ultimately we we knew that going in and budgeted for it from the start. And it's uh, you know high five figures, low six, uh, but that was always uh, understood. And out of a ten million dollar effort uh, to save lives over the winter and uh, try to route people into housing where we could uh, uh, using referral services and make sure people's basic medical needs were attended to, uh, such as overdose prevention. Um, uh, those were all costs of doing business uh, and uh, certainly uh, no, uh, no desire to in any way reduce or, or, uh, or minimize the, uh, uh, that there will be some cost, but that was always assumed and planned for. Council's asked lots of questions about that in the past. The order of magnitude is, is public and when the bills are in, um, we can certainly tally it all up. But it was built into the budgets. So there's, there's no surprises here from my perspective. I don't know, Andre, do you want to add anything on that? 
Um, just that I don't know the specifics about uh, the denial of taking a look at it, but we could certainly work into that. I, I suspect they're doing some deep cleaning and uh, preparation for construction, so we can uh, deal with that offline. Jeremy, do you have a follow-up question? I, I do. I, I think it, it was mostly addressed um, by by Andre there. Um, as just we sent a camera down to to have a look at the outside of the building today, and uh, they were they were told by security there to to leave. <laughs> um, essentially, being told that it was private property. So I, I'm wondering, actually, not essentially, they were told it was private property. I'm wondering when the uh, the outside portions of the of the conference center became private property. The work site at this point, where um, where work is being undertaken. So, um, as as the city manager said, we can work with you, and if uh, if and and get some more information around uh, the circumstances on the site. The idea that something's being withheld here or that there's anything other than some wear and tear on the facility i have real concerns with the premise of that um uh, so you know i think we can follow up with you on this and make arrangements to be entirely transparent i'm uh, about uh, uh, the condition and ultimately the cost but but um you know i sit on the explore edmonton board at every meeting we've discussed this and so the oversight for those responsible for that facility uh, as well as the city which has undertaken to cover the costs has been uh, thorough and and there are no concerns from a board and management perspective that i'm aware of that uh, there are going to be any issues with uh, doing the needed maintenance to get the facility up and running for its normal use so um, um yeah. Okay. Thanks for your question, Jeremy. We will uh, look into that for you and follow up with you after this. Uh, next up, we'll go to Natasha Reeb with CBC. Hi, thanks, Chris. Um, Mayor, this question is for you first. There is renewed concern about people not physically distancing even outside in public. Um, it sounds like history repeats itself here. <laughs> Last year, we, we were talking about people on stairs not doing that. We're hearing the same thing now. Uh, we're coming to really nice warm weather. Uh, what would you like to say to Edmontonians about uh, renewing that call yet again to remember to do these things? So I think it's important to remember that what got us through last summer relatively unscathed worked with the basic version of the virus. The, vir the variants that are now uh, running rampant here in Alberta in the situation we find ourselves in are much more tenacious. Being outside in the breeze means there's lower risk, but there is still more risk than there was with the virus we had last year. So between more serious variants and higher complacency because more folks um, are tired and I understand that and more folks either have vaccines or assume others do and that everything's going to be okay. It will eventually, but we are not there yet. And so uh, distancing, masking, uh, these are critical tools in the toolbox for us while people uh, get some exercise um, outside uh, while respecting uh, others uh, and and doing their best to stay safe. So vigilance is the order of the day here. Um, now more than ever because of these much more virulent strains. Natasha, do you have a follow-up question? Um, yeah, thanks for that. And uh, Andre, you had mentioned that the, the, the health safety compliance team would be kind of picking up in size and activity based on provincial uh, restrictions. So what, I mean, we know that the focus is education. So what can Edmontonians expect coming this weekend, for example, uh, in terms of what we just discussed, um, more so like outside and the behavior outside? Yeah, as I mentioned, we're definitely triaging those areas where we're hearing concerns about and, uh, What's um, helpful with the data we presented today is it helps us target where, where we need to go and what we need to look at. And so it's based on what Edmontonians are telling us and it allows those compliance teams to zero in on those locations that may be problematic. So we certainly heard in, in recent days about uh, taking a, a look at the stair uh, areas in the River Valley, we will do that. 
we've uh, we've uh, heard uh, last week about uh, White Avenue and some of the other places where we wanted people to be outside. And of course, that that will change a bit given the patio restriction this week. But essentially, those teams are looking at that all the time, and we'll move them into the right locations to to take a look at those uh, areas where Edmontonians and others are telling us. Uh, that we need to uh, ramp up the compliance. And then I just want to add that um, while masking compliance remains very, very high, um, it is a bit of a social distance thing. And I think that's just a bit of uh, the um, the excitement of this beautiful weather and spring we're having. And the, the other thing I wanted to add is um, not only is Edmontonian compliance high, but the businesses that were open um, uh, recently had a 99.5% compliance rate, which really tells us that the business community is taking this seriously and doing a fantastic job of helping uh, us in this time. Thanks for your questions, Natasha. Uh, lastly, we'll go to Phil Heidenreich from Global. Phil, go ahead. Hi there, thanks for taking my question. Um, I don't know if this is for Mayor Iveson or Mr. Corbel, but um, you can correct me if I'm wrong. My understanding is that there was already coordination between police, um, health inspectors, OHS, emergency responders, peace officers and whatnot with regard to uh, enforcement of uh, COVID um, uh, measures, but I know this is more something for the province to answer, but what has the province told you is different? We heard from Minister Madhu that there's a new plan, but I think a lot of people are curious what that plan is. And I wonder if he's given any kind of direction to the city. I can just start by saying that uh, I think that one of the significant things that the province has done is change the uh, the fines uh, for non-compliance, especially for a repeat offender. So that's a very, a very uh, specific step. As for the specifics of the, the, the teams, you're right, we've always been coordinating along that way, but there has been uh, coordination uh, with uh, EPS in the province and all the entities to, to further enhance where that's done, how quickly it's done, and what the focus areas are, and making sure uh, we're addressing the, the specific issues being raised by Edmontonians and by others. Thanks for your question, Phil. Do you have a follow-up? Uh, yes. Can you tell me, um, and I again, I don't know if either of you would be able to answer this, but um, has there been any direction given that um, from the province that there should be more of a move to enforcement rather than education now, as in, you know, people shouldn't be hesitant to give out fines or people should relax giving out fines. Has, has there been any direction specifically that way? There's certainly been no uh, specific direction to the city of Edmonton uh, from the province on that. We continue to take an approach where we educate first, we ensure people are aware of the ever-changing health measures. Tickets are issued in situations where people are repeatedly ignoring the Public Health Act orders or where the severity of the situation warrants an immediate enforcement uh, at that specific time. And that's what we'll continue to do, uh, but we're not going to count uh, or evaluate uh, our, our uh, compliance by the number of tickets. We're going to evaluate our compliance by the actual compliance, which is why we're focused on people who are wearing masks and the social distancing aspect. Just, I would just supplement that um, the city responsible for enforcement of our mask bylaw, as well as um, uh, prosecutorial follow-up for municipal bylaws, and we've been rigorous about that. For the provincial health orders, which are the stronger orders, as they should be, um, the city is involved. Uh, with enforcement, and we appreciate being delegated the enforcement authority to our peace officers. Uh, but when it comes to prosecution of those, that is more in the hands of the government of Alberta. And I think that is the larger question that has been raised in the last few days, is the government of Alberta's policy over time with respect to following through on accountability. So it's one thing for us to write a ticket on a provincial health order. It's another uh, to follow through on um, making that stick through the courts. And um, and so I think fair questions have been raised about that and, uh, um, and, and those can only be answered by the Solicitor General. 
Thanks, Phil, for your questions. And thanks to all the reporters for joining us today. I think that wraps up our media veil. Thanks to the mayor and city manager and the interpreters for helping out and for everyone joining us on the live stream. Have a good evening and stay safe out there. Thank you.